Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with yet another integral, and today we have the integral from 0 to 1 of log x divided by root x times 1 minus x squared dx. And we're going to start off with a very obvious looking substitution. Well, it sort of seemed obvious anyway. Why not let x equal sine theta? This would imply that dx equals cosine theta d theta. And this means that i is now the integral from, well, as x approaches 4, x to approach 0, we need theta to approach 0. And for x to approach 1, we need theta to approach pi by 2. Then we have the natural logarithm of sine theta divided by root sine theta times 1 minus sine squared theta. And the differential element is now cosine theta d theta. Okay, cool. So we know that 1 minus sine squared is cosine squared. So that means we have the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of log sine theta divided by root sine theta times cosine theta, cosine theta d theta. We have some nice cancellation taking place. So this implies that the transformed integral is that from 0 to pi by 2 of sine to the negative 1 half of theta times the logarithm of sine theta d theta. Now the strategy for solving this integral is going to be similar to a few other integrals I have solved that had similar structures to this one. So to regular viewers of the channel, the following is going to seem pretty familiar, whereas if you're new to the channel, then do hit the subscribe button because, well, I solve cool integrals. I mean, what more reason do you want to subscribe? I solve cool integrals, that is awesome. Anyway, so we have this integral, and now I'm going to define an integral function i of some parameter s as the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of sine to the s of theta d theta. That way, when we differentiate with respect to this parameter, we have the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of the partial derivative with respect to s of sine to the s of theta d theta. So that means we now have the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of, now we're differentiating partially with respect to s, so that means the sine theta is going to be treated as a constant. So we have sine to the s of theta repeated times the logarithm of our constant base, which is, in this case, sine theta. So notice that for our purposes, for the target integral that is, we need s to be equal to negative 1 half. So i prime of s is this. And the target integral i is actually i prime evaluated at s equal to 1 half negative one half that is. Okay, cool. So how exactly are we going to evaluate i of s? And then what I'm trying to say is how exactly are we going to figure out the derivative of i of s? Well, i of s is actually very similar to a very special integral that defines a very special function. That is the beta function. So the beta function with complex arguments u and v is defined as twice the integral from 0 to pi by 2 of sine to the 2u minus 1 of theta times cosine to the 2v minus 1 of theta d theta. So looking at the structure we need, or comparing it with the integral function i of s, we see that 2u minus 1 equals s, which implies that u here equals s plus 1 by 2. And the cosine term is missing, so that means 2v minus 1 should be 0, which implies that v equals 1 half. Okay, cool. So this implies that i of s is actually 1 half of the beta function evaluated at s plus 1 divided by 2 and 1 half. And now we can invoke the relationship between the beta and the gamma functions. So the beta function with complex arguments u and v equals the gamma function at u times gamma v divided by gamma u plus v. So in our case, we have i of s equal to one half 
of gamma s plus 1 by 2 times gamma 1 half, terribly sorry about that, and much better, divided by, oh wait, that was perfectly correct. Anyway, it's divided by gamma s plus 1 by 2 plus 1 by 2. Now, gamma 1 half is famously equal to root pi, so we have root pi by 2 times gamma s plus 1 divided by 2 divided by gamma s plus 2 divided by 2. So that is i of s. And now that we have i of s in terms of gamma functions, and we know plenty of values, special values of the gamma function and its derivative, we can now differentiate with respect to s, and we get i prime of s equal to root pi by 2 times, now we have to apply the quotient rule, so much easier. We have gamma s plus 1 by 2 times gamma prime s plus, uh, wait, 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 s plus 2 by 2, s plus 1 by 2, minus, I need some more writing space here, so I'm going to make a slight adjustment, minus gamma s plus 1 by 2 times gamma prime s plus 2 by 2 divided by gamma squared s plus 2 divided by 2. And we have the derivatives of the gamma function involved here, so it would be useful to invoke the digamma function. Now, for those of you not familiar with the digamma function, it's totally cool. We have digamma s, or psi of s, defined as the derivative of the logarithm of the gamma function. So this gives us in the denominator gamma s, and up top we have gamma prime s because of the chain rule. So this implies that the derivative of the gamma function, terribly sorry about that, equals gamma s times di gamma s, which is pretty cool. So I can expand the derivatives of the gamma function in the above equation for i prime of s, and that would give me i prime of s equal to root pi by 2 times all of this stuff, that's gamma s plus 2 by 2 times gamma s plus 1 by 2 times di gamma s plus 1 by 2 minus a similar structure. We have gamma s plus 1 by 2 times gamma s plus 2 by 2. And I'm going to have to zoom out a bit. Okay, that should be enough. Times di gamma s plus 2 by 2. And this whole thing is going to be divided by gamma squared s plus 2 by 2. So we can factor out some things here. We can actually factor out gamma s plus 2 by 2 and s plus 1 by 2. So we have gamma s plus 1 by 2 times gamma s plus 2 by 2 divided by gamma squared s plus 2 by 2. Some nice cancellation happening here as well. Oh, wait. Wait. And there we go. And what we're left with is the digamma function at s plus 1 by 2 minus the digamma function at s plus 2 by 2. Okay, cool. So that means we're left with root pi by 2 times gamma s plus 1 by 2 divided by gamma s plus 2 by 2 times this difference of digamma functions. Digamma s plus 2 by 2. Now for the target case, we need s equal to negative 1 half. So this implies that i prime at negative 1 half equals root pi by 2 times gamma Negative one half plus one is one half divided by two, then you get a quarter. So we have gamma one quarter divided by gamma three quarters. And we have di gamma quarter minus di gamma three quarters. So we now have this difference of di gamma functions that's really easy to express in a nice closed form by using the di gamma version of the reflection formula. So Euler's beautiful reflection formula states that gamma z times gamma 1 minus z equals pi times the cosecant 
of pi times z. So taking the logarithm gives us log gamma z plus log gamma 1 minus z equal to log pi times cosecant of pi times z. And differentiating with respect to s gives us di gamma z. It, we're differentiating with respect to z. Sorry about that. Uh, minus sign because of the chain rule, and we have di gamma 1 minus z equal to, over here we have pi times the cosecant of pi times z. Then because of the chain rule, we have a constant multiple of pi. Then we have the derivative of the cosecant, which sorts out to be negative cosecant times cotangent. So that's what we have. And then we have another factor of pi because of differentiating pi times z. So we have some nice cancellation taking place. And this implies that di gamma z minus di gamma 1 minus z equals negative pi times the cotangent of pi times z. So we needed di gamma 1 quarter minus di gamma 3 quarters. So we're going to let z equal to a quarter, which implies that di gamma 1 by 4 minus di gamma 3 by 4 equals negative pi times the cotangent of pi by 4 and tangent of pi by 4 and cotangent of pi by 4 both equal 1. So that means we have negative pi over there. Okay, cool. So this implies that the derivative of i with respect to x, uh, with respect to s sorts out to, wait, we're evaluating the derivative somewhere, and that was negative 1 half, and this sorts out to, what exactly did we have? Yeah, we had root pi by 2 times a bunch of stuff, right? So we have root pi by 2 times this negative pi factor because of the di gamma functions. Then we have gamma 1 quarter divided by gamma 3 quarters, which is good enough to call it a day, but there's a way to express gamma 3 quarters in terms of gamma 1 quarter. And that is, again, using the reflection formula. So gamma 1 quarter times gamma 3 quarters should be equal to pi times the cosecant of pi times 1 quarter. So that would be pi times root 2. And this implies the gamma 3 quarters equals pi divided by root 2 times gamma 1 quarter, which looks pretty cool. And this implies that the derivative of i at negative 1 half equals negative pi times root pi divided by 2 times gamma squared 1 quarter divided by pi times root 2. Correct. So that means we do have some nice cancellation happening once again. And we're left with negative 1 by 2. No, wait, wait, wait. Negative root pi divided by 2 times root 2 times gamma squared 1 quarter. That's the derivative of the integral function at s equal to negative 1 half. But what about the target integral? The target integral was actually one half of this derivative, if I remember correctly. Yeah, so that means the target integral equals negative root pi by 4 times root 2 times gamma squared 1 by 4. And there's actually a very nice closed form in terms of another important constant called the Lemniscade constant. So gamma squared one quarter divided by what exactly? Yeah, it's two times root two pi. This thing here equals lambda bar. That's the lemniscate constant. So this implies that gamma squared one quarter equals two times root two pi times the lemniscate constant. That means we can plug in this result and we get i equal to, what exactly do we have? Yeah, that's negative root pi by 4 times root 2 times 2 times root 2 times root pi times the lemniscate constant. So we do have some nice cancellation once again, factor of 
2 left in the denominator, root pi times root pi is just going to be pi. So we rather have this very beautiful result. I mean, it's really compact. We have the integral from 0 to 1 of the natural logarithm of x divided by root x times 1 minus x squared dx. And this thing is going to be equal to the very nice closed form of negative pi by 2 times the lemnus gate constant. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Do drop me a follow on Instagram. And in case you like the channel, in case you feel like you're learning something from it, do consider supporting me on Patreon. Thank you. See you next time.